you're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY Musician Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to another edition of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin, your host for the show, and this is episode number 38. Well, before I get too far, I have some exciting news. We finally launched a music podcast, and it is called the CD Baby Music Discovery Podcast, where we'll be featuring music from where else but cdbaby.com. It's already up in the iTunes podcast directory, so head on over there, take a listen, and subscribe. Uh, We'll soon have links to it from CD Baby. And uh, just so you know, you'll spot the difference. This podcast is using the same logo, but it's green instead of the blue that uh, marks the DIY Musician podcast. So be looking for that. And I'm sure the first thought that popped into your head after I mentioned the new music podcast was... How can I get my music on the podcast? And to answer that question, there are a couple things you can do. The first thing is to subscribe to the podcast, listen to it, and support the show by leaving us some positive feedback on the podcast page in iTunes. That obviously won't get your music directly on the podcast, but if you support the show, it will guarantee that it's around for a long time and hopefully we'll be able to branch out into more genre-specific shows like we have planned and As we branch out, we'll need more and more music, which increases your chances of getting it played. Just so you know that for this podcast, all the music in each episode is being selected by our editors. You know the guys, they're the ones that listen to every album before it goes up on CD Baby. We're putting them to work, and we're going to be featuring various types of music around a theme, some obvious like Christmas and holiday music, which we're featuring right now, to the more obscure like I hear pirate music is on the horizon and some other things like that. So the other thing that I would recommend if you're interested in getting your music featured on the new Music Discovery podcast is to listen to the podcast and get a sense for how we're using different themes. Put a little thought into it and make a suggestion. If you come up with a cool theme that fits with your music, maybe we'll use it. And I can tell you that we'll probably get a lot of spam concerning this new podcast. People who don't take the time to actually listen to the show and understand what we're trying to do. So since this is the DIY Musician podcast that you're listening to right now, and we're an artist community, I will let you know that sending spam messages won't do anything to help you get featured. But taking the time to listen to the podcast and some patience and a little thought will go a long way. I named this new podcast the CD Baby Music Discovery Podcast as I've been thinking a lot about how people discover new music. There's an enormous amount of music out there, both by indie artists and major label artists alike, and you've probably heard it referred to as the reality of the glut on this podcast. And as indie artists, one of our biggest challenges we face is breaking through that glut and getting our music out to people who are looking for it. The cool thing is technology is always advancing and there's always some new tool or some new thing popping up to help people discover new music. So for today's episode, I interviewed Tim Westergren, the founder of Pandora, which has become one of the most unique music discovery devices out there. Pandora is, to sum it up, an internet radio station, but it goes way beyond your average internet radio and helps the user discover new music, exactly the type of music they're looking for and want to hear. It's my opinion that artists who take the time to understand new innovative services like Pandora and how they use information about the music to make musical choices, the artist that understands that will have a big advantage in breaking through the glut. But before we get to the interview, Robert is going to give us a tour of Pandora to set the stage for the interview. And I should also say that I was fighting a pretty hefty cold when I interviewed Tim, so I sound a little funny, but here's Robert with uh, the Pandora tour.
Hi, everybody. This is Robert. Um, since we're interviewing Tim Westergren for today's episode um, from Pandora, I thought I'd do a little audio walkthrough of the Pandora experience. Some of you may already use Pandora on your computer or cell phone, so this may be familiar. It's important to realize as a musician what services like Pandora are doing to level the playing field for indie musicians. Okay, so let's go to pandora.com. And you may hear some traffic noises in the background. My apartment is not the most soundproof uh, <laughs> environment, but uh, that's okay, right? There's a podcast, not... Okay, so here we are. Um, it's starting to play some music. I'm going to stop it for a sec. It's really easy to sign up to Pandora. If you don't already have an account, it's free, and it's quick and easy to sign up, and I don't think I've ever been spammed by Pandora or anything like that, so... Basically, the first thing that happens once you've signed up is it'll ask you to create a station. You can continually create new stations. I've probably got about 25 stations that I've created. So it'll ask you, type in the name of your favorite artist, song, or composer, and we'll create a radio station featuring the music and other music like it. So I'm going to go ahead and type in Bob Dylan. It says Create. And it says, we're now creating a station that will explore songs and artists that have musical qualities similar to the artist Bob Dylan. And hey, look, it's Bob Dylan. Now, it won't always necessarily play exactly what you're asking for. Sometimes it'll play something similar, but it will usually mix in the artist that you've chosen along with other similar artists. I'm going to turn this down a little bit. Now, it, it shows me a picture of the album that this... Uh, song is playing on and then it gives me a thumbs up or a thumbs down option and a little menu like um, why is this song being selected move to another station you can bookmark this song it'll have it'll have links for how to purchase the album the thumbs up and thumbs down is is pretty easy way of saying don't I you know I like the song and I want to hear it again sometime in the station or I don't like the song don't play songs like this anymore um, and then you also have a skip button, so you can skip to the next song. I'm just going to go ahead and skip to the next song. And then it tells me from here on out, we'll be exploring other songs and artists that have musical quality similar to Bob Dylan. This track, Forever Young by the band, has similar major key tonality, acoustic rhythm guitars, and many other similarities identified in the Music Genome Project. And the Music Pre Genome Project is basically the software and, as well as the sort of editing choices that the people at Pandora make. And yeah, the band is a great match because Bob Dylan played with the band. <laughs> and you only get, I think you get about seven skips and then, a, and then you have to listen. One of the cool things about Pandora is that once you've created a station, you can click add variety to this station and add another artist to mix in with it. So, so I've got a Bob Dylan station, but I'm gonna type in Radiohead. You know, that, that may cause some interesting results or just sort of a mix of, uh, and it says, we've now added songs that share musical qualities with the work of Radiohead to your station named Bob Dylan Radio. And now it's playing a song from Death Cab for Cutie, which, you know, may, <laughs> may or may not be, in, be related to Bob Dylan, but it's definitely related to Radiohead. It's not something that you have to sit and click on and give the thumbs up and thumbs down all the time. Usually I just put it on and leave it on while I'm doing things around the house. And it's, you know, and every once in a while, if I hear something that's really great, I'll just run up and give it a thumbs up. And uh, you get to keep these radio stations. They, you know, every time you log in, they're still there. And the radio stations progressively learn your taste. The really cool thing about it is how you can discover new music because something you you really like comes up and then you know you give it a thumbs up and then you hear it again and then if you want to find out more about the group you can you know get information um through pandora there's actually a buy button for um each album so you can buy it from itunes or amazon um just with the click of a button and you can see how this would be really an advantage for indie artists who just want to throw their hat into the ring so they might be discovered through this really cool um service and while you know i might get Three songs from Bob Dylan, something from the band, something from Death Cab for Cutie, but then something might just come up that's completely, you know, indie, so, uh, like an unknown band might come on, and uh, and then I get to, you know, really listen to something that's new and indie and cool and, you know, give give my opinion, either a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and then the software learns. Anyway, that's just a brief little tutorial introduction to what Pandora is. Definitely, if you haven't checked it out, you should and uh, have a great time. It's a cool way to listen to radio. I also I have an iPod Touch and I can also listen to Pandora 
um, on my iPod Touch, which is just super cool. So I hope you enjoy the interview, and over and out. A record is really a record. It's an archive of a moment in your musical history. And you the should. most valuable thing that you have as a musician or an artist is what makes you different. A really good engineer knows how to handle digital and not make it sound like digital. You know, politely asked, would you consider featuring this video? One of the challenges that everybody has is what I call the reality of the glut. A journey and a process, and it's not a And I never actually thought that I would do this for a living. Yeah, really, what is art? It's magic. It's this thing that we don't understand. That... All right, well, joining me on the phone is Tim from Pandora. Tim, how you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Well, Pandora has definitely become a, a household name around CD Baby as far as uh, the, the coolest way to listen to music and discover new music on the internet. Why don't you start out by giving us a little history of how the idea even came about and then explaining what Pandora is and the whole music genome project? Sure. So um, the company is about nine years old. I actually founded it uh, about January of 2000. So we're coming up on nine years. And... The, the website itself, Pandora, is only three years old, but we've been, we've been working on it for much longer than that. Wow. And the original idea behind, uh, behind this was really to build a recommendation technology. We, we actually didn't start uh, with a radio in mind. We thought we were building uh, sort of a, a technology that we would license to other sites as a means of helping people discover music and, and as a means of helping musicians find their audience, in particular sort of independent musicians who, you know, traditionally don't have much of a promotional voice. I'm, a, I'm a, actually a musician myself. Hmm. And the idea really grew out of my own experiences as a musician, playing in bands for a long time, and then as a film composer, where I spent a lot of time thinking about kind of how music is put together and why it has the effect that it has and, you know, how it works in a movie and, and why people like music. Um, and I came up with this idea of sort of codifying this sort of taste profiling that I did when I was a film composer um, and sort of capturing all the details about songs so that I could then sort of compare them and connect them based on musical similarity, mm -hmm. which truly really was what inspired the idea for the Music Genome Project that now powers Pandora. So uh, what exactly is the Music Genome Project? So what? it's, it's an enormous collection of songs that have been analyzed musicologically um, along uh, close to 400 attributes per song by a team of trained musicians. Um, so we have a staff of about 50 musicians who are all professional, you know, well-trained musicians, typically have a college degree in music theory. Mm -hmm. and, and what they do is listen to songs one at a time and, and literally score them along hundreds of musical attributes that sort of collectively describe the song. Wow. How long does that take for each song you listen to? Well, it depends on the song, of course. Um, for a really simple three-minute pop tune, it might take between 10 and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And for something longer, uh, like a rock opera or maybe a classical tune, it could take up upwards of two hours. Wow. You mentioned on, the, on your website, you, you kind of refer to these attributes as genes. What, what are some of the, the genes that you would attribute to a song that may not, you know... I, I, I can imagine that you probably have like the typical genre classifications, but it must go way beyond that. What are some of the things that the average person may not think about that you guys are classifying it under? Yeah, we actually try to avoid um, using genres uh, in our classification. What we've done is we've taken sort of every aspect of music, so melody, harmony, rhythm, form, instrumentation, you know, lyrical content, the sound of the voice, vocal mm -hmm. harmony, et cetera, and broken down each one of those aspects into these granular genes. So a voice, for example, has um, about 30 attributes assigned to just understanding the voice. Hmm. And those would include things like, you know, the range, um, the use of vibrato or falsetto, the timbre of the voice, the actual sound, like what are the, what are the sonic layers in the voice and identifying each one of those. It's kind of like musical primary colors. Wow. So this, this whole genome project evolved from the beginning and then about three years ago when you launched the website, is that when you started the internet radio along with the website? Yeah, so we, we initially set out to, to build this tool that we would license to other sites, and, and we spent almost five years chasing that business. And it wasn't until 
to the latter part of 2004 that we decided to really completely refocus the company on radio. And we sort of repurposed this enormous sort of database that we had been building into a playlist engine. Pandora has obviously become very successful, and uh, its name pops up in in the media all the time in in regards to some of the fighting going on over the royalty rate hikes uh, in in Congress and all and the Copyright Royalty Board and such. What is Pandora's role in all of this, and what why is it such an important issue? So. Pandora is one of, obviously, hundreds, I guess, thousands of webcasters that are impacted by what's going on with licensing. And uh, lately, in particular, we've participated as part of uh, a group of large webcasters under the umbrella of DEMA, which is the Digital Media Association, Mm -hmm. um, sort of collectively negotiate with the rights holders who, who sort of convene under the umbrella of sound exchange. And what's at issue is essentially how much money we should be paying for every song that we stream. And that's a fee that is governed by a federal statute called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And that, that fee was, um, was hiked uh, about a year and a half ago, far beyond kind of the economic realities of internet radio. Mm-hmm. And so we've been in this long... Um, very difficult uh, negotiation, which finally looks to be reaching a conclusion. Mm-hmm. And and what is that conclusion? Is is it something where it's going to settle back to something a little more fair, or? Yeah, it certainly is a reduction from the the rate that was published by the copyright office. Um, I can't go into details about any of the numbers because it's not it's literally not finished yet. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, it's an effort to kind of. Um, bring that number down into a realistic uh, place that webcasters could actually afford. And um, there's still going to be a lot of inequity. And, and one of the one of the real um, axes we have to grind is that uh, there are, you know, call it three principal forms of radio. There's um, cable and satellite radio. There is terrestrial radio and there's internet radio. And uh, because of the of, of sort of strange, outdated legislative rules, each of these forms of radio pay radically different amounts of performance fees. So, internet radio pays somewhere around sixty to seventy percent of their revenue, gross revenue, currently for the big webcasters in performance mm-hmm. fees. Um, the uh, cable and satellite pay about seven and a half percent and terrestrial pay none. And we all compete, so it's this very, very bizarrely unfair mm-hmm. um, sort of economic structure that really needs to be addressed. Well, I, I just saw a comment today by an artist on one of our message boards about one of these blanket-type fees. Who does that fee get paid to, and then how does it ultimately get back around to the, the copyright holders or the artist? Yeah, so um, there's an entity called Sound Exchange, which is the intermediary for the fees that we pay. They're kind of like the ASCAP equivalent for digital rights. Mm -hmm. So every month, Pandora takes a complete census of all the songs that we play, and we write a check to Sound Exchange. They then, in turn, turn around and disperse that half to the artists and half to the labels, you know, per the amount of that each song has received, they keep 10% for themselves as an administrative fee. So 90% of that money is distributed. Mm -hmm. Which means if you're an artist, you have to be a member of Sound Exchange to get that money, which is a relatively straightforward process. So obviously your service is free, and um, you're making most of your income through advertising. Is is that correct? Just advertising on the website as people listen to the, the radio service? That's correct. You know, I'm an iPhone user, and, and when the, the App Store opened up, I immediately saw the Pandora application there and downloaded it. And and it really seemed like a, some sort of a, a game changer to me where it was like, okay, this is something that it, may, it made a cool service have more appeal than it already had just by the fact that it was almost like an iPod inside my iPhone that knew everything and knew what I wanted to listen to. Have you guys seen some uh, pretty positive results from that application? 
know, the iPhone has had a dramatic impact on us. Um, it, it's almost doubled our growth rate. Wow. Uh, so we add almost half the listeners we add, not not quite, but almost half the listeners that we add every day are, are new iPhone listeners. And I think perhaps more importantly, um, it's, it's also um, sort of altered the conversation around internet radio mm-hmm. to where people are now talking about it as something that you know you listen to in the car or you know when you're jogging and i think people are realizing that this really is a viable alternative to broadcast radio no matter where you are mm-hmm. and and that for us is a huge change because currently the vast majority of our listening happens at work mm-hmm. between 9 and 5 and if you look at overall radio listenership only about 10% of overall radio happens at work. So we've been playing in this small sandbox, this 10% sandbox. And in order to kind of realize the potential of internet radio, we have to be available um, for the other 90%. And that's why sort of anytime, anywhere is so critical for us. And I noticed that when I first got the uh, Pandora app that there wasn't any advertising, but I figured that probably would have to change at some point. But now I notice there's a little Best Buy ad that pops up. Are you guys still experimenting with uh, how you're going to make that work so it can still be maintained as a free service but make sense for you guys? Yeah, you know, we're, we're, um, we have 30 people that, are, that spend ju- nothing, all their time doing nothing but sell, advertise, and invent ad products. And so... You're going to see sort of an ongoing innovation on that side. And mm-hmm. we started with the, the visual stuff because that's actually the most mature part of the online ad market, the mm-hmm. interactive stuff. That's where the budgets are, and, and that's where the high CPMs are. But over time, we're certainly going to introduce you know, audio and figure out how to incorporate that in, and especially on mobile devices where you, where you don't have quite the same canvas to play with. So, you know, we're going to do everything we can to monetize it efficiently without, you know, being overly intrusive on the uh, listener. Mm -hmm. Well, where do you see uh, Pandora heading from here? I mean, obviously, like you mentioned, that iPhone doubled your listenership. Do you guys have any other new initiatives like that to to try and expand your reach even further? Well, um, I I guess I would say that our our goals right now are pretty straightforward, um, although they're grandiose. Um, We're... We want to make Pandora the the world's largest deliverer of radio, mm-hmm. and so that means, of course, recruiting a lot more listeners, um, and and obviously building the economic engine around that to make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, to get there, we have to make Pandora ubiquitous. So we're putting a lot of effort into this anytime, anywhere piece, you know, trying to make it available not only on cell phones and connected devices, but you know, in cars and um, in the home with all these home network systems coming along. Mm-hmm. Um, we're on a couple already, but have a lot more in the works. So we're, we're really trying to make it uh, as easy and ubiquitous as broadcast is. So soon I'll be going to a Toyota dealership and they'll have a Pandora radio installed in the new cars. Yeah, yeah. and I'll have to thumb up and thumb down on the steering wheel. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, obviously you guys have to have a ton of music. How do you even manage a library that large? Well, it's certainly a growing um, catalog, and not only do we have to manage this enormous audio catalog, but also this immense amount of data that we're collecting because, you know, we we uh, curate these stations based on the thumb up and thumb downs that people uh, apply to their stations, and that's all done in real time. So there's an enormous amount of sort of personalization information that has to sort of get fed back into these stations, and, and that's a... You know, literally a couple billion thumbs have been given already, so it's an it's an enormous sort of technical uh, operation that does all of that. Not to mention just the raw amount of audio we stream. So, if a certain song gets constant thumbs down, do you guys eventually kick it out of the catalog, or is it still just stay in there for occasional use? Well, we never kick it out altogether. Um, what what a thumbs down will do is it'll make a song play less frequently on that station where the thumbs down was given. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean that it might not pop up on another station, but listeners of the, you know, the Coldplay station or the Print station or whatever, they collectively are kind of weighing in on the genome's choices, and over time that, that influences how often songs play, but just for those stations. When you mention that you've got 50-some people listening to all these things, 
I'm sure there's been people telling you that you need to automate the whole system to make it quicker or just more efficient. Is Have you considered that or is it something where you think it's extremely important to have real humans actually listening to the music to make these classifications? And believe it or not, uh, machines can't do this. Mm -hmm. There's actually a pretty, pretty robust um, field of machine listening. Mm -hmm. Um, and they've been working on this problem for a long, long time and have not been able to build uh, anything that even remotely approaches what a human ear can do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're, we're um, n no alternative in sight. I, and I also do like, um, uh, you know, creating jobs for musicians. Yeah, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah that is important. <laughs> well, I noticed that there's there's been several copycat type services I've seen pop up that I haven't really used, but I'm assuming that they're not doing the same kind of classification that you are. It just seems like it would be silly for someone to try and imitate you guys to that level at this point when you've already done it so i was just kind of curious if other people have been coming out of the woodwork saying hey we've got a way to automate all this so you don't have to to have people doing it but we keep a close eye on all this stuff and have yet to see something that really you know has moved the needle yeah since our listeners are indie artists as well is there a way that they can submit their music to be considered uh, for placement in pandora's system yeah, absolutely. We, we have a, the instructions are on the website. Okay. Our FAQ. There's a submission process. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, anybody can submit. Do you pretty much accept everything or does, is there like a, you know, a line between, you know, being included in the Pandora catalog and, and uh, stuff that's just not quite up to par? Yeah, we have an editorial filter, so things do get auditioned. Okay. And I'd say about Maybe 30% of the submissions wind up in Pandora. Okay. All right. Well, I will definitely have uh, all our artists check it out and send you some CDs and right. help you build that catalog. Well, unless you had any last uh, comments, I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, look forward to seeing what you guys do in the future. Great. Well, thanks for your interest in us. And, and we are big fans of CD Baby, so um, mutual. that's going to do it for this episode of the DIY Musician Podcast. Be sure to check out Pandora. I guarantee you'll get hooked on it. And also check out the new CD Baby Music Discovery Podcast in the iTunes Podcast Directory. As always, we follow up an interview episode with a roundtable edition of the podcast. So that means you still have time to get your listener phone calls in. We love getting your phone calls, your feedback, and your stories and comments. And the number for our listener line is 206-426-5683. And uh, you can also find that on the podcast website at cdbabypodcast.com. Our email address is just info at cdbabypodcast.com. And uh, that should do it this time. We'll catch you next time. Bye. You've been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 